marriage of his parents was an arranged marriage. They were just brought together and told by their parents that they were going to get married, and they'd never seen each other before. And this is the way things were done in those days in Russia. And it so happened that they were wonderfully suited for each other. They were wonderful parents, and they had a marvelous life together. And an older brother who died at the age of 13, and he had a sister and another brother. The brother is currently in Tel Aviv, a scientific laboratory worker at one time in France. It tells of how he was such a beautiful baby. People used to walk down the street and stop when they saw him because he was so beautiful and his mother dressed him so beautifully. And this was true even as he grew up into to be uh, eight, nine, ten years old. He was extremely handsome, and uh, he was always stocky, and as a young man and later on in life, he was extremely strong, powerful man. Uh, by the age of 13, <coughs> he made the decision that he could not get the kind of education or have the kind of life he wanted in Russia. And at that time, he was born in 1904, and by the time he was 13, it was about 1917, and uh, war was going on. But uh, there was the Balfour Declaration by England with respect to, this, to establishing Palestine as a homeland for the Jews. And he made a decision that he would go to Palestine. And uh, so he undertook a journey, and uh, his, uh, which eventually took six and a half months for him to get from Russia to Jaffa. He stopped along the way at Bialystok and at and at a number of other cities major cities before he reached Jaffa. His mother had given him some money, and there lies an interesting story. She had, uh, she always prepared things well in advance. So, for example, if she was planning to give her son money to take an uh, important voyage, as this one was going to be for Moshe, she carefully put the money aside so that when the time came, she could uh, hand it to him. And was, as was frequently the case, when the time came, she forgot where she had put the money or whatever it was that she was hiding. In this case, she had forgotten where she put Moshe's money. The time had came, come for him to depart. And so she had to rush out and get money elsewhere in order to send him on his way. She gave him the money for which she figured he could live on for about four or four and a half months. From uh, Moshe's own hometown, liked the idea of what he was doing, and they decided to join him. And as they went on their journey across Europe, uh, they picked up more and more boys until eventually they were a crowd of 200 who were marching across the country with Moshe more or less in the lead. And they would reach towns, and the towns would be very uh, enthusiastic about what they were doing, and, and they would give the boys money, put them up in schools, and although the circumstances for sleeping were most uncomfortable, they were young, and uh, it didn't bother them to sleep on bare floors and school benches. The cities that uh, Moshe encountered, they were having a big feast in the center of town. And uh, it, was, uh, it was a, a roast of pork that they were doing. Well, it was a roasted pig, but it wasn't the pork part. It was uh, called speck, or speck. And uh, he smelt it, and he was hungry, 
decided that, he, that although all his life he had been brought up in a kosher home and the milk and the meat dishes were kept separately and uh, of course they never had anything like uh, any pig products to eat he decided that he was going to make a new life for himself and he decided that he would have the speck so even though he was miles and miles and miles away from home he suddenly had a guilty conscience once he made that decision and he started to look around him to see who was watching him and who might report the news back to home that he was going to eat speck but he didn't see anybody and he ate it and it was delicious it was extremely delicious and not long thereafter he became violently ill and he said he turned green and he was sick as a dog and so after a few hours of the illness and throwing up everything he was very hungry again so he decided he would try the speck again so he went back and he ate it along with a half a loaf of bread and it was delicious and this time he held it down and he was able to eat things like that without any problem thereafter. In Palestine, he started immediately as one of the laborers building a village. And at first they uh, erected tents before they started building buildings uh, because uh, they then wa they wanted something quickly from which they could protect themselves in the event of attack. Uh, once they had their tents erected, they started building buildings nearby. And in the next uh, six years, I think it was, he had been involved in the building of 82 buildings, I believe the figure was. I know a lot about building, and it was very hard physical labor. Very great weights of cement onto the second story for the building, which were two-story buildings. He made one friend uh, he spoke of among the Arabs, and this man was handsome and strong, and uh, was one of the people involved in the building. And uh, the man had a beautiful wife, and it was the custom that the husband would ride a donkey uh, to go anywhere and the wife would carry perhaps a hundred weight on her head and uh, she would have to trail after the donkey as the husband rode along the feet hanging down from the sides of the donkey. Well, the Arab was such a good friend of Moshe's that he told him uh, a, a sort of a secret and he let him in on the fact that when nobody was looking he would let his wife ride on the donkey and he would follow behind on foot and he felt very badly that he had to follow the custom of uh, letting his wife ride the donkey when everybody was looking because had anyone seen that she was allowed to ride the donkey, then it would have been rather disgraceful for her family and uh, other members of the community. Very active in the Haganah. This was the organization which was organized to uh, resist the injustices that were perpetrated on the Palestinians by not only uh, the Arabs, but by the British. And uh, Moshe was involved primarily in teaching the Haganah how to defend themselves. And he decided that the thing to do would be to write and publish
publish a book on jiu-jitsu. So he did write the book, and then the time came for publication. And he came to the conclusion that if he published this, or had it published through the Haganah organization, that the British would come after him and either kill him or put him in jail. So he made the decision that he would think about the publication, and as soon as it was published, he would leave for France, and there perhaps get the education that he felt that he should have. He happened, the book was published, and he did go to France. That working with his hands, as a construction worker was pretty much a dead-end street and that for him to get it to achieve what he wanted to achieve in the world and I don't know what that was maybe I'm wrong in saying that but in order he felt it was important to train his mind now and to get on with advanced learning and he had been doing a lot of uh, trigonometry and advanced calculus on his own. Well, he was at quite a disadvantage when he arrived in France because he didn't speak any French. He wants to study French very hard. He became adept at it. I hear that another contributing factor to his going in France was that he had been playing in a soccer game. He'd done a, done a lot of soccer playing. And in one game in particular, he was playing against an Arab and a huge man. And uh, the Arab uh, was much taller than he. But he realized how he could block the Arab, and he did so by jumping up in a way which landed his force of his weight on the Arab's chest and the Arab would fall back and uh, be gasping for breath completely out of wind thought he was dying and after three times the Arab changed his tactic and again Moshe changed his in order to be able to uh, thwart the Arab in the soccer game and the Arab kicked the ball Moshe would his, one of his legs uh, way out and uh, in one of these gambits his knee instead of bending in the normal way was knocked out of joint and was bending in the opposite direction from which a knee normally bends and uh, Moshe was in extreme pain and he was out of its socket I guess and uh, he instructed one of his co fellow players uh, to stand with his back towards Moshe, just as a man stands when he is taking the boot off of another man. And uh, Moshe told him to grab his Moshe's leg, put it between the man's leg, and then Moshe, with his good leg, pushed the man away all the while that the man was holding Moshe's out-of-joint knee. And uh, immediately the knee went back into place. But that was the end of Moshe's playing career because that night and for the next six months the knee was extremely swollen and painful. And uh, this was an, uh, an influencing factor, I believe, if memory serves me correctly, in uh, Moshe's of deciding to go to Paris, and, or at least to continue his studies. Because after having had his knee reset on the playing field, Moshe rode his bicycle home. He was in a school, and uh, he was uh, t told that he should be taking notes. And in the first part, the first third of a, of a, first third of a trimester, he was so busy taking notes, he said, that he couldn't pay attention to what the professor was saying, and he ended last. He was the last man in a class of 
had stopped taking such copious dots apparently and he was well up near the top of his class and in the third trimester he was the top student in the school I'm in Marche's education uh, the pound was devalued and he found that uh, instead of having uh, what he thought he had, he had exactly half of it. If, to continue his edu education was going to be impossible. But the head of the school asked him if he would, he caught, summoned him. And Moshe thought that he was summoning him to ask him where the money was that uh, uh, Moshe owed the school. And uh, but the head of the school said, uh, we would like you to go to the Sorbonne. And Moshe said, but I have no money. I can't afford it. I can't afford the tuition. I can't afford the room. I can't uh, support myself. And so the uh, schoolman said, we'll pay the bills for you. And Moshe was very surprised and of course delighted. And he said that he would be able to make some money of his, on his own if he could have some space somewhere to teach judo, a small judo class. So the school head said, go through this building. It was in Paris. And uh, he said, uh, go through the entire university here and pick any room you want. You can have it. So Moshe found a room. And uh, it was a little small, but it was on the eighth floor of the building, overlooking the entire city of Paris. Beautiful sight. And he decided to take it. And, and he told the school head, school had said, fine, it's yours. Well, another reason that, uh, and perhaps, and it, I believe it was the reason which Moshe decided, uh, uh, influenced Moshe to decide to leave Palestine, was that after he had finished building an opera house, he appeared at the opening night to see the opera. And he came, he, he, he had worked hard that day as a concrete worker, and he, but he had gone home and washed, and put on a clean white shirt and a tie, and uh, he was clean, but everyone else uh, was either in uniform or in formal attire. And when he came to the opera house, they said he couldn't go in. And he was infuriated. He said, I felt like blowing it up. And uh, so he went back and he was furious. And he said that he realized he had gone as far as he could with his hands and he better uh, achieve some intellectual attainments. And I think that was the contributing factor, the turn down of admittance at the opera, which was a turning point in his life. He was uh, in uh, Paris. He uh, was told one day that Kano, uh, the man who was responsible for judo in Japan, was going to be in Paris. And uh, so he was told, wouldn't you like to go here? You work in judo and all that. And he said, no, I'm busy. I have so much to do, so much schoolwork to do, so much judo teaching to do. But finally, he decided that he would go. So he went to the building where uh, Professor Kano was going to be uh, accompanied by uh, an entourage, and uh, they wouldn't let him in. And this brought to mind the occasion when they wouldn't let him in the opera, and he was furious again. So he said, I am 
said, I have written this book, and he opened it up, and there was dedicated to Professor Kano. So they bowed, and uh, whoever uh, saw, spoke, he spoke to, a Japanese, and uh, he was told to wait. And pretty soon, uh, he was waiting, and he thought they'd forgotten him. And here again, he saw everybody, the, the ambassador was there, uh, and uh, many dignitaries, and people in splendid uniforms, and he was just dressed like a school student. And uh, so Professor Kano finally came out, and uh, uh, the, and eventually Professor Kano and the ambassador together. Professor Kano, uh, when they finally got around to talking, referred to Moshe's book on judo and said, this will not work. This defense will not work. And uh, Moshe said, all right, take a knife and uh, come at me with a knife. And Moshe just sat there at a table as Professor Ntikano uh, approached him with a knife, a sharp knife, and Moshe went plop, and the knife spun across the room. Professor Kano did it again, and the same thing happened. Now, Professor Kano was 90 years old at the time, but he was very well built. He was small, but strong still, and very good health. And with Professor Kano was a man who later became the head of judo, a judo school or a judo system in Japan. And this man was a powerful, six foot five or six foot ten Japanese with huge shoulders and he moved like a gazelle, Moshe said, and later he said he moved like a tiger, very gracefully and very powerfully like a lion. And uh, so th th this, this man took the sharp knife and came after Moshe, and again Moshe's defense worked. The knife went spinning, and Moshe, incidentally, before the attack came, he said to Professor Kano, please be sure to step aside because I don't want the knife to fly towards you and I knock it out of this man's hand. But the way Moshe discovered this move to disarm an attacker was that he had seen that after studying jiu-jitsu for uh, a long time, uh, the, the people in Palestine were unable to use it effectively. What would happen is that they would be beautiful in the gym while they were practicing for three weeks, and then they would go back to uh, their job, whatever it was, and then if an attack came, they were wiped out. And uh, so he got to thinking, what can I do so that they can really defend themselves? So he started to think about what is the basic motion that a man makes when he starts to defend himself without thinking. What does he do without thinking? And then the, uh, this move that he finally included in his book and showed to Professor Kano is the one that he developed which everybody could do, even if they didn't have a thought and were scared to death, they would automatically do this move to defend themselves. They uh, developed a specific movement, was that he attacked the students in his class with a knife, one by one, and they all had the same uh, immediate, uh, unthought-out response, and it was based on this response that he developed this wonderful move of his, and Professor Kano later told him that Moshe was the only white man who had made a uh, contribution to the uh, judo moves, uh, which were known as rules, I believe, uh, and uh, Professor Kano had uh, for a long time tried
had was married, and uh, when he was at first with Professor Connor and the ambassador, he wanted to call his wife so she wouldn't worry. But this time, Moshe had was married, and uh, when he was at first with Professor Connor and the ambassador, he wanted to call his wife so she wouldn't worry that he wasn't coming home. He had no idea that they had this huge banquet. Uh, not for him, but he, he was one of the guests. And they had told him uh, when he sat down, you can order anything. So he heard uh, someone order uh, trout, tweet. And uh, so he said he'd have that. And he didn't know how to handle a trout on a plate. He'd never eaten one before, so he just watched and followed what everybody else did. So finally, late at night, he told he was able to call his wife, ask permission to call his wife, and he did. And then uh, somewhere after two o'clock in the morning, they took him home. He said he would take he would walk or take a cab, and they said, "Oh no." And they put him in a uh, Rolls Royce with ambassadorial flags flying on it. And they took him into his neighborhood. And he was treated royally by the Japanese people. And uh, subsequently, he had about uh, nine or ten, I've forgotten exactly how many meetings with Professor Kano uh, before Kano died and uh, had become a very good friend of Kano's. In this period, too, Moshe mentioned that he had in his judo class the two curies, both uh, Madame and Monsieur, and uh, also Picard. And uh, uh, his wife worked for Madame Curie, who was hiding her from harm. They were after her, I'm not sure. In any event, Madame Curie hit her out for three years, and Moshe's sister was a very valued employee of the laboratory there. In weighing chemical combinations, I guess, or chemicals said that uh, probably his meeting with Kano, more than anything else, was what impelled him to move into the field that he is in now. And uh, he described this field of Kano's as the efficient teaching of mind over the body. Uh, Moshe was so impressed, he said, because these were the first dignitaries, the ambassador and Professor Kano, he had ever come into close contact with. Of course, he said later on in life, he met many heads of state and uh, other famous people. That so many of them knew a lot about whatever their specialty happened to be, but they were so empty in other areas. He was not involved in any of the pogroms in Russia, but he certainly heard a lot about them. And uh, he didn't want to, have, he wanted to get out of that country at an early age. And then when he finally had enough money, he sent for his parents, and he went to come to Palestine. And in order to get them in, he had a pay for a permit, which cost 1,000 pounds sterling, which he said was at that time amounting to something like half a million dollars, which he borrowed and then spent years paying for. And this sum did not include the cost of transportation to get the parents over here. Another incident that comes to mind as a young boy, Moshe was uh, in the company of a very dapper, elegant man. And uh, the man took out an, a bundle of money and said, here, take as much as you want. And the man, he said, looked very grateful and sort of 
like a dog would look. Uh, uh, his master, and he's grateful, of course, that Moshe didn't tell on him. Moshe kept the story to himself. Another uh, recollection is that through the years, after having met Professor Kano, uh, he not only saw him a number of times, but Professor Kano gave him priceless gifts. Five millimeter movies, basic judo, which Kano had worked out. They offered a lot of money for them or for a copy of them, but he wouldn't take it. He wouldn't uh, accept the money or make a copy. Films still are in his possession. Right in the uh, TV film, uh, there was a moment when Moshe and the cameraman were pausing, but the camera was still flush on Moshe, who very nonchalantly put his finger in one nostril and picked it elegantly and then put another finger in another nostril and did likewise. It's a sight that one doesn't often see on television. Shea comes out as being a very lovable man, a very humble man, caring and loving. absolutely charming is his life story. He uses an expression like silly ass frequently and he's comical, thoroughly endearing. An anecdote uh, I would mention here is that uh, he's said that he was a very close advisor, perhaps the closest advisor to Ben-Gurion for 20 years. He said that Ben-Gurion had no friends whatsoever except Moshe. Moshe was his only real friend. Still another anecdote. During the period that Moshe was working so very hard, constructing buildings and lugging concrete. He learned what women were all about. And for a period of time there, he was working this very hard on his construction work. And then every night, all night long, 